Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Gopi Janavalama Kiri Varadhani Gopi Janavalama Kiri Varadhani Giri Varadha Jisoda Nandana Praja Dhyana Handhyana Jisoda Nandana Praja Dhyana Handhyana Jamun Tira Jamun Tira Havan Hare, Hare Rama, Hare, 
So the worshipful deities in Sri Sri Mayapur Dham is Sri Sri Radha Madhava Astasaki. So we worship them along with Panchatattva and Lord Nishringadev. Uh, Panchatattva Prabhu was the main pujari for Lord Nishringadev, still is the main Nishringadev pujari. And so many times around the world when devotees had health problems or any kind of problems, there would be a petition coming to Pankajangri and Pankajangri would offer a puja special for that person to Lord Nusringadev. So he was very much absorbed. In fact, every day when we would greet the deities and then we would go from First we would do the Nishringa Arti, and then we would go to Panchatattva altar to do the Panchatattva Arti, and we would sing uh, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Doya Kodamore. And then after that we would go to Brata Madhava's altar in the main temple, and everyone would be in anticipation for the deities to open when the kirtan was going on. And we then, Radha Madhava would open along with all the Astasakis and everybody would gather around and we would sing the prayer uh, along with the greeting of the Didi song. 
the uh, and after that, after they would greet the deities, then they would bring a palaquin into the temple, big one, and they would take the deity off the main altar of Rishi Sri Radhamadava. They would take Srila Prabhupada's deity. Who, there was a pretty good sized brass deity on the main altar of Srila Prabhupada. So the palaquin would come right in front of the altar and everyone would move aside and then they'd put Prabhupada onto the palaquin and then someone would offer Prabhupada Chari Namrati from Radha Madhava, really beautiful. And they would offer the Chari Namrata and they would offer the cloth and they would offer the, wa the water first to dry, to wash his hands and the cloth to dry his hands. Then four men carrying the palaquin would take the palaquin in front of Lord Nishringadev's altar and Prabhupada would take darshan the Lord Nishringadev. And then they would take the palaquin after that and go around to throughout the whole temple and it would be a kirtan. And then the devotees would follow. We'd go all around Panchatattva altar, around Arata Madhava's altar, all the way back through the main temple and around three times with a night, wonderful kirtan. And then finally, after going around three times and the kirtan was going on nice, then they would take Prabhupada to his Vyasasan and then they would take Prabhupada's deity off the Vyasasan and place it in front of the the regular Prabhupada Murti there and then Guru Puja would begin. It's such a beautiful festival. So when Prabhupada would go in front of Lord Nishringadev's deity, um, all the sannyasis would be standing right behind Prabhupada. And as soon as Prabhupada would leave, uh, then we would file up, lining up one after another, and we would get, um, um, what would we would get? Oh, they would put the feet of Nishringadeva on our head, like this. And they would put it, one, two, three, four, four places. And I was always, I was always like a person who never followed all the rules, you know, still don't follow them. <laughs> so the, the, the sannyasis would just go up and get that, but Pankajangri would be there put the, putting it on everybody's head. But on top of the feet of Lord Nishringadev, you have that big thing, and then there's the feet, and there's some Tulsi leaves up, up on the feet there. So I would always go. And he would look at me, and he would take the Tulsi leaves off Tulsi Shrigade's feet, and he would always give them to me. I do it every day. <laughs> so I was always getting Lord Shrigade's Tulsi leaves from his feet. And Pankajangi was always, you know, he was always willing to give me the Tulsi leaves every day. And so I was just thinking, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> And then he'd give me a bunch sometimes. He'd give me whatever was on the top there, sometimes four or five Tulsi leaves. And people would say, oh, Maharaj has got those Tulsi leaves. So people would jump at me, <laughs> sometimes knock me over. you know. So, and then I would quickly take one Tulsi leaf to make sure I got my quota <laughs> and distribute the rest to the, whoever was there. So he was always really nice about it. I mean, some Pujaris could say, just, you know, Maharaj, come on, go, you know. <laughs> but he didn't. He would always give me the Tulsi leaves. And I lived next door to him. We were in the Brahmachari, the senior Brahmachari ashram up on the second floor. And so um, I was in room 27 and he was in room 26. And so. And room 25 was reserved for Radhana Swami whenever he would come to Mayapur. And room 24 was uh, Janani Vas. So we were like in a row there. Janani Vas and Radhana Swami when he was there, and then Pankajangri, and then little old me in room 27. And usually Kadambakana and Maharaj would always get room, in the room next to me. <laughs> so that was the lineup. <laughs> And Jayadwaita Maharaj would always go in room 23 when he'd come, so that was one side of the, we were always on the sun side to catch the sun. 
So when, when I would be there, and sometimes I'd pass Pankajangri's room and he'd be in his room, he would always be reading Srimad Bhagavatam. He'd sit, and he'd have a desk, and he'd put his book on his desk, and he'd just sit there, and he would read for a long time. Usually he was doing service to Radha Madhava or to, Radha, to Nishringadev, but he, when he wasn't doing that when he was in his room. He was always reading Srimad Bhagavatam. He loved Bhagavatam. And he would give classes practically once a week uh, on Srimad Bhagavatam, sometimes at night also in the Bhagavad Gita classes. So he was uh, amazing. And we, we, became, we became really close friends. We would talk many times. So by Krishna's arrangement, we pray that uh, he stays with us because he has such a such a wonderful devotee, along with his brother Janani Vas, who is Brahmachari par excellence. I mean, he's sannyas, but he never wanted to take the sannyas order. Both of them are sannyasis, but they remain Brahmacharis throughout their whole life, and they were they've been there since 1970. I think Janani Vas came in 72 or 73 to Mayapur and uh, Pankajangri came a little bit later they both they were both from the UK they came and um, they've been there since Pankajangri would come out once in a while and travel did he ever come here yes. yeah on the Atra right yeah yeah he would come here he would travel, Janani Vas would travel throughout India. Janani Vas would never hardly, would never leave uh, India. He, but he would hardly even travel in India. He would stay in Mayapur with Radha Madhava. And they sometimes, there was one period in my time when I was there, they invited me for lunch. They invited me one day for lunch and then I invited myself the rest of the days after that. <laughs> Because they would always get these big, gigantic Maha plates of Lord Nisringadev's prasadam. Whoa, it was like, whoa, what do you do with all that? <laughs> and so, you know, after about a week or two, I was thinking, I think I'm eating too opulently here. So I decided <laughs> to just slow down a little bit. And they would, they also did. They were start after a while, they started eating kitchri. But we, for a while there, we were really scooping up on the Maha, the, you know, the entire offering of Norton Shringadev is like, you know, 30 or 40 preps for lunch. <laughs> so they give it all to Janani Vas and Pankajangri. And then I would sneak in there <laughs> and get my share. So yeah, they, they were always really kind to me. And uh, yeah, we became real, and we'd all dance together too. I have a beautiful, um, sometime, maybe I'll show it to you, it's a, it's a kirtan, with, it was in 2007, in uh, Pune, it was the Pune Yatra, run by Radhana Swami, and so the four of us are dancing together, myself, Janani Vas, Pankajangri, and Radhana Swami, and we dance for hours, <laughs> and uh, who was leading the kirtan was Gorvani. You know Gorvani? Yeah. yeah. Gorvani, he was yeah, he's a he's a kirtan monster. So he <laughs> he was leading the kirtan and uh we were in a there was about three thousand people watching the kirtan and we were dancing like on the stage. It was a huge area we could dance and spin around and jump and fly this way and that way. And uh, so we had kirtan for, I don't know. And towards the end, they did this whole show of uh, Nishringadev killing Harani Kashipu. And it was like an animated dance show. And you see, uh, it's really interesting. You have to see it to believe it. <laughs> So that was, you know, it was a beauty. That was a, one of our memorable times together. We would dance. I would, Janani Vas and 
Ponka Jangri, they would do their um, their Krishna Balaram dance. I don't know how to describe it, but it was something you have to watch and see it before you can really understand what it is. <laughs> so yeah, so they, we you know we were like dance partners for a long time. So Ponka Jangri was always really friendly and always eager to serve the devotees. He loved to preach, he loved to, to engage in kirtan, but he had so much responsibility with, with uh, Lord Nishringadev. He took really good care of Lord Nishringadev for many, many years. I guess because of his sickness now, he had to stop his service, but even up, he was always taking care of Lord Nishringadev for years and years. So he's under the care of Lord Nishringadev, so we, but still we should make our prayers and express our feelings to Lord Nishringadev. Lord Nishringadev has his plan, so let's see. But we, we, we should offer our prayers to Lord Nishringadev. And as Prabhupada taught us to pray, my dear Lord, if you so desire, please cure Heal my good friend, God brother, dear devotee, Pankajangri Prabhu. That's how we pray. We don't say, my dear Lord, please cure him. We say, if you so desire. We leave it up to the Lord, but we express our feelings. This is our feelings. This is what we would like. <laughs> but we also acknowledge that the Lord is the supreme authority and he knows. But he is, in, the Lord is inspired by the prayers of his devotees. So when we sincerely pray, the Lord hears. So we just heard that today he left Mayapur and went to Calcutta for some emergency hospital treatment, so we'll have to see what happens. But he's in quite serious condition. He, his one lung is not working properly, and he can't breathe. So he's on full oxygen continuously. So it's uh, very difficult for him at this time. And he's, he's, he's quite elderly. He's about 76 years old. Although he's still very useful in his activities, he's, he's quite, well, he's about 76. I know he's older than me, so that's, he's about 76 or maybe even, maybe even 77. Yeah, okay. So um, just I wanted to mention a little bit about Pankajangri. There's much more we could say, but we'll say it again at another time. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this is chapter 10 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, uh, verse number 3, the opulence of the Absolute. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Yomam Majam Anadim Cham. Veta Loka Maheshwaram. Asamuda Samart Yesu Sarva Papai Pramuchite Yome Ajam Anadimcha Veti Loka Maheshwaram Asamuda Chasmarteshu Mart Mardyeshu Sarva Papai Pramuchyate Yomam Majamana Dimcham Cha V 
Preti Loka Maheshwaram Asambuddha Samardhyesu Sarva Papai Pramuchyate Yeah. Anyone who? Mum. Me. Ajam. Unborn. Anadim. Without beginning. Cha. Also. Veti. Knows. Loka. Of the planets. Mahishwaram. The Supreme Master. Asamuda. Undiluted. Sa. He. Mar Yesu. Among those subject to death. Sarva Papai. From all sinful reactions. Pramuchchite is delivered. So Krishna is speaking. He who knows me as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the Supreme Lord of all the worlds, he only, undiluted among men, is free from all sins. Krishna is saying, if you know me as being unborn, without a beginning, the, the Supreme Lord of all the worlds, then you're free from all sins. Hmm. Purport. Now stated in the seventh chapter, Manushyanam Sarasheshu Kaschid Yatiti Siddhyaye Siddhaye. Those who are trying to elevate themselves to the platform of spiritual realization are not ordinary men. They are superior to millions and millions of ordinary men who have no knowledge of spiritual realization. But out of those actually trying to understand their spiritual situation, one who can come to the understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the proprietor of everything, the unborn, is the most successful spiritually realized person. In that stage only, when one has fully understood Krishna's supreme position, can one be free completely from all sinful reactions. Here the Lord is described as the word aja, meaning unborn. But he is distinct from all living entities are described in the second chapter as Aja. The Lord is different from the living entities who are taking birth and dying to, due to material attachment. The conditioned souls are changing their bodies, but his body is not changeable. Even when he comes to the material world, he comes as the same unborn. Therefore, in the fourth chapter, it is said that the Lord, by his internal potency, is not under the inferior material energy, but is always in the superior energy. 
Hmm. Very long purport. Well, here it's explained that uh, the living entities are unborn, and Krishna is also unborn. The word aja, unborn, one who does not take birth. So we do not take birth either. But because we come into this material world, we accept the material body, and we are put under the external energy of the Lord, which has a principle of uh, temporarily. So appears that we take birth. It appears that we go through different life symptoms and life, life situations. And we also leave the body, and that is called death. But we don't die, and we are not born. That's the good news. Guess what? You're going to be around for a long time, because <laughs> you're eternal. <laughs> the question is where you want to hang out. Do you want to hang out in Ljubljana, or you want to hang out in Vaikuntha? <laughs> in either case, you, have, you are eternal. So that's, that's the good news. So the idea of birth and death is simply, an, is simply an illusion. But because we have a body, the body goes through changes, and we call the appearance of the body birth, and we call different stages of the body, youthhood, boyhood, middle age, old person, and then we also say death. All of these are features of the material body, which we are not. We are the soul within the body. So we move the body, but the body is not us. Just like the ex perfect example, and the thing that Prabhupada always talks about, is the car. You know, the driver in the car is not the car, but he makes the car move. The presence of the driver means the car is moving. Otherwise, there's no movement of the car in the same way. Because we are in the body, the body is, the eyes are blinking, the ears are hearing, and the, the organs are all working in a certain way, all because of the energy source. The soul is the energy source. So Krishna, he is the source of everything, but he, he is Ajya, and we are also Ajya, but he is a different kind of Ajya. He is the Ajya that doesn't accept any other body than his own pure spiritual body. So he never changes his body, and therefore he is eternally existing in his pure transcendental form as the Supreme Lord. No matter where he appears, whether he appears in this world, or in the spiritual world, or in any of the universes, he is always in his same spiritual essence. So one who knows that Krishna, because Krishna says that Krishna takes birth, he came 5,000 years ago, he appeared in an area called Vrindavan, he had a mother, Yasoda, father, Nanda Maharaj, and he grew up, had plays, playful, playful activities with his friends, and at different stages in his life, he acted like an, a slightly similar, like an ordinary person growing up in this world. But even in that body, although it appears to be changing, it's always spiritual. It changes in its existence but it doesn't change in the fact that he doesn't change his body. We change our body. The cells are always you know, either dying and reproducing and we get in a different body. That body you had when you were born, where is it now? It's gone. It's, if you have a picture of you when you were first born, you say, well, that's me. No, it doesn't look like you. you know. Or even when you get a little older, and you're a little girl or you're a little boy, and you have this particular body, now you have a different body. You see our bodies are always changing. Some people say growing, but growing is not really a, an accurate way to describe how the body moves. It changes. 
even the scientists say that every seven years you get a completely new cellular structure within your body. There's a whole science to that where the cells divide themselves into themselves and then uh, a part of the cell, uh, each time the cell divides itself, there's a lesser division and that is called difference as that exp expresses itself in how our body gets old. <laughs> there's a whole scientific explanation of how the body gets old by the different stages the body goes through like that. But none of, that, none of it has to do with you. Because we can, we can remember, oh, I had a little girl's boy's body, now I have a grown up body, soon I'll get an old body, and then this body will be gone, and I'll be somewhere else. So all these changes are simply the features of the body. But Krishna doesn't have a material body. So he doesn't go through the changes. But when he appears in this world, he appears like an ordinary person. But he doesn't, his body is not material even when he comes to this world. Although it acts in that way, it is always transcendental. Otherwise, how could he kill so many powerful demons? How could he kill a powerful Rakshasha Wichi when he was only one year old? Or even before that, he simply by kicking the cart, he was laying under this cart full of pots, pans, and utensils. He simply touched it with his feet and the whole cart crumbled and smashed to the ground. So he, even though he's a little tiny baby, he exhibits great power because his godlike power is always with him at all times. So he can exhibit, you know, it's just like when he was seven and a half years old, he lifted this great mountain called Govardhan Hill, which was 60 miles you know, around and how many, how many miles high, it was also very high. He lifted it with the finger of his left hand, seven and a half year old boy. <laughs> so his godlike power is always with him. But his body appears to go through different stages just like but actually, it's described that for every year that Krishna lives, he grows a year and a half in proportion to ordinary children. This is the interesting. Krishna's growth. In other words, an ordinary person will grow so much in a year, but Krishna will grow a year, uh, a equivalent of a year and a half within one year. So he grows up much faster than other people. <laughs> this is using his spiritual power in his material, in the material world, how he exhibits himself. So when you know that he's unborn, he has no beginning, he has no end, and he is the supreme power within all the worlds. Here it says that uh, all your sinful reactions are destroyed immediately, simply by that knowledge. <laughs> that means not only in this life, but in millions of lives that we had before, when we were not even committing, and not even practicing devotional service in many of those lives, how much sinful activities that we have accumulated. So simply by have the, having this transcendental knowledge of the nature of the Supreme Lord, uh, this, that means this, this knowledge is so powerful that it destroys the reactions of all sinful activities ever committed in any of our lives, life after life, very powerful here. So it goes on. In this verse, the words Veti Loka Maheshwara indicate that one should know that Lord Krishna is the supreme proprietor of the planetary systems of the universe. He is existing before the creation. He is different from his creation. He makes the creation, but at the same time, uh, he is different from the creation. The example is, is the spider. The spider exudes the web from his body. It comes out of the saliva of the mouth of the spider. And that's how the spider makes his, it comes out from his saliva, and he makes his spider web. You like to hear about that? No? Okay. Spiders are not so nice people, anyway. 
And so, and then he makes this web and he lives on it. And then when he wants, he can just bring it back into his body. He can just bring it back in. He has that power. So in the same way, Krishna emanates the, the creation and when he wants, he can bring it back into himself. But he remains distinct from his creation, although he's the source of the creation and the source of the dissolution of the creation. So that's what's being said here. All the demigods within the created material world, all the demigods were created within this material world. But as far as Krishna is concerned, it is said that he is not created. Therefore, Krishna is different even from the great demigods like Brahma and Shiva. And because he is the creator of Brahma, Shiva, and all the other demigods, he is the supreme person of all the planets. Mm -hmm. Krishna is so powerful that it's no one can describe in any sense of the term the extent of his power. So here we get a little understanding of his relationship with everything. See, Krishna is therefore different from everything that is created. And anyone who knows him as such immediately becomes liberated from all sinful reactions. So it's interesting, it's repeated. If you know he's different from everything created, it says you, you've immediately become liberated from all sinful reactions. One must be liberated from all sinful reactions to be in knowledge of the Supreme Lord. Only by devotional service can he be known and not by any other means, as stated by the Bhagavad Gita. One should not try to understand Krishna as a human being. As stated previously, only a foolish person thinks him to be a human being. This is again expressed here in a different way. A man who is not foolish, who is intelligent enough to understand the constitutional position of the Godhead, is always freed from sinful reactions. So Prabhupada keeps repeating that over and over, make a point. If Krishna is known as the son of Devaki, then how can he be unborn? Here we go. That is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. When he appeared before Devaki and Vasudev, he was not born as an ordinary child. He appeared in his original form and then he transformed himself into an ordinary child. So when he appeared in the jail cell of Kamsa in front of his mother and father, he was completely decorated as the Supreme Lord. Anything done under the direction of Krishna is transcendental. It cannot be contaminated by material reactions which may be auspicious or inauspicious. The conception that there are things auspicious and inauspicious in the material world is more or less a mental concoction because there is nothing auspicious in the material world. Okay, here we go. So, we tell people, and sometimes we don't even believe it, everything in this world is bad. <laughs> it's all <laughs> <laughs> everything. So then you think, oh, Maharaj, you're one of those fanatical sannyasis that just make everybody feel bad. What hope do we have for any happiness in life? <laughs> So, but Lord Chaitanya, and there he is on the altar, you can ask him. He says, Bhadra Bhajra Sakale Sama, E Manda, E Bhadra, E Brahma Sama, something like that. He said, Some people say this is bad, and some people say this is good. I say it is all men mental concoction. Everything in this world is bad. Haribo. Hmm. Hare Krishna. That's the Lord Chaitanya spoke that verse himself. Uh, I remember I wrote that verse one time and I sent it to the Back to Godhead magazine because in the back they, they put these different verses in the back. If you've seen the last page, they like to add some very important verses. So I sent that in to be published and it never got published. <laughs> they didn't like that one, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, what can you do? <laughs> so 
So nobody, nobody wants to believe that this world sucks, but it does. <laughs> it really is really a bad place. <laughs> Prabhupada was in Mexico City, Mexico one time, and uh, uh, there was, it said, uh, there was one of these big green dumpsters where you throw your trash in. They have these big giant things. You can throw trash into it. So Prabhupada saw it and on, on the outside it had some writing in Spanish. So Prabhupada was with his devotees and he asked the devotees, what does it say there? And it's, the devotee said, Prabhupada it says, put your garbage here. And Prabhupada said, yes, this is where the whole world belongs, right here. <laughs> it's on tape. <laughs> so, uh, after this class, I hope you feel okay. Don't take any aspirins because... <laughs> when you understand that this, there's nothing in this material world that's good, then you can actually understand where real good is. It exists in the spiritual world. This material world is a place where we have to prepare ourselves to, to go back to the spiritual world. So while we're here, we're doing all kinds of activities, but our activities are meant to elevate our consciousness so we can qualify ourselves to go back home, back to Godhead. Although we might perform activities that seem to be done by ordinary people, our activities are meant for the service of the Lord, and therefore they don't have any material reactions to them, and they elevate our consciousness to the principle of eternality where there's a, there's a machine, it's this one bhajan by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He sings about this one song. And then he mentions this one machine, it's called Deki, it's a Deki machine. A Deki machine is a wheat husking machine. And so when you want to go to your field and cut the wheat that you grew, you bring the Deki machine and it does that. So Prabhupada said, if you take the Deki machine from this world and you bring it to the heavenly planets, what will it do? It'll husk wheat. If you take it to the hellish planets, what will it do? It'll husk wheat. Wherever you take it, it does the same thing. So this is a devotee. Wherever a devotee is, he serves the Supreme Lord. Whether it's in hell, heaven, Ljubljana, or Zagreb, or... <laughs> Where else? Maribor, uh, all nice places. Miami Beach, Florida. So you know. So whatever, wherever devotee is, the devotee doesn't care what the material energy is like. Some places are nice. Some places are not nice. Some, but the devotee is just thinking how to serve, and therefore. The material world doesn't have much of an effect on the devotee. The devotee always sees how can I use what I have to you to serve the Lord. And whether you're in heaven or you're in hell, you do the same thing because that's the nature of a devotee. He just wants to serve, that's all. And if you're serving and you're in hell, you're in you're in with Krishna and if you're in if you're in heaven and you're not serving, you're in hell. <laughs> so service makes the difference. When we're connected to Krishna, then everything we're around is wonderful. And when we're not corrected to Krish connected to Krishna, no matter how wonderful everything is, it sucks. <laughs> because that's the nature of the material world. There's an old, there's a saying in this world, <laughs> You can't, uh, you can't win, and you can't stop playing. This is the nature of material energy. You can't win, and you can't stop playing. So you're in a losing game if you're in the material world. But in the spiritual world, or in the sp in devotional service, you can't lose, you can't stop playing, and you're always winning. Because whatever you do in devotional service, even if you wash the floor or whatever, even the smallest service, 
you're preparing yourself, you're preparing your consciousness to go back home, back to Godhead, where life is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. And this material world is just what it is. It's a place to give you trouble, that's all. That's why Prabhupada said there's nothing auspicious in the, in the material world. And then he goes on to say everything is in, inauspicious because the very material nature is inauspicious. We simply imagine it to be auspicious. Real auspiciousness depends on the activities of Krishna consciousness and full devotional service. Therefore, if we want at all our activities to be auspicious, we should work on the direction of the Supreme Lord. Such directions are given in authoritative scriptures such as Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita from a bona fide spiritual master. Because the spiritual master is the representative of the Supreme Lord, his direction is directly the direction of the Supreme Lord. Okay? So we can't approach Krishna directly, but we can get Krishna directly through his representative, the bona fide spiritual master. The spiritual master, saintly persons, and scriptures direct the same way. So here's the three points. You want to learn what is devotional service, what are the principles. You hear from three sources, guru, sadhu, shastra. These are the three sources. There is no contradiction in these three sources. All actions done under such directions are freed from the reactions of pious and impious activities in this material. Prabhupada would say, pious and impious, they're all impious. <laughs> because they make you forget, or they actually lead you away from your real activity, which is transcendental loving service to the Lord. The transcendental attitude of the devotee in the performance of activities is actually called renunciation. And that is called sannyas. As stated in the first verse of the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, one who acts as a matter of duty because he is ordered to do so by the Supreme Lord and who does not take shelter in the fruits of his activities, asrita karma phalam, is a true renouncer. Okay. So this is the word, we use the word sannyas and we apply it to a specific order. But what it means, it means to act under the direction of the spiritual master and serve the Lord and not looking for any personal gain from that service. Anyone acting under the direction of the Supreme Lord is actually a sannyasi and a yogi. So it's not a matter of dress. And not the man who is simply taking the dress of a sannyasi or a pseudo-yogi, like that. Hmm. Okay, so we'll stop there, I think. We're probably at the end of our class. Any questions or comments? Jai Sri Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. There is one question through internet. Yeah. Um, Avaduta Rai Prabhu. Mm -hmm. If human body is attained by Agyata Sukriti in animal species as per Bhaktivinoda Thakura in Harinam Chintamani, it seems that most of the jivas are doomed to eternally rotate in lower species. species. It's, it's what do you think? It seems like most of the species are grouped. Doomed. doomed. Is that what? Doomed? Is that? What's the word? Are doomed, yes, 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 doomed, yes, doomed, doom, d double o m e d. Yeah, doomed. Okay. To eternally rotate in lower species. What do you think? Well, if you look at the proportion, even the the the, the count is there are eight million four hundred species of life, and only four hundred thousand of those eight million. 400,000 are human forms, and out of those human forms, only a few are civilized. So to get a civilized human form of life is very rare, yeah. So it doesn't mean that that species, or the soul that's traversing through the lower species is doomed. They're just in a lower position, and if they stay within the evolutionary cycle, 
then they gradually transform up to the human form of life. So the human form of life is a gift. If we waste it by not using it, it's the greatest form of loss. Because most living entities in the material world don't have human bodies, or they have human bodies that are less than human, more animalistic. So, um, Krishna is fair, but material energy is very strict. So yeah, they have to eventually transform or transmigrate until they come to the human form. And then, adato brahma jigyasa, in the human form of life, then you can stop this repetition of birth and death. You can't stop it until you get to the human form of life. Mm -hmm. So, not doomed, but in a very difficult situation. Doomed means, means there's no chance for anything better. But there is a chance. <laughs> Yes. What will happen with all the souls after the Kali Yuga, especially those one which didn't, I mean, finish the the task in material world, the the chance they have. So Kali Yuga is end, then then is. Brahma night and then another Brahma day, what will happen with those souls? Does they start with the previous position? Well, the yugas continue one after another. It's only after 1,000 cycles of the four yugas that the uh, souls at that time go back into the body of Mahavishnu and stay in that body until there is the next creation. And then they re again appear in their same situation with new bodies to pick up where they left off in their last. But that happens after 1,000 yuga cycles. After the end of Kali Yuga, then the next yuga is Shachi Yuga. That comes right on practically immediately after. There is there is an interim period of a, a few hundred years, and then such yuga comes in again. But it's only when the cycles go one thousand times, then those souls, because there's no creation, and that's Brahma's night. Then they all go back into the body of Mahavishnu. And they stay there for until the next, according to the schedule, the next time for the the millennium or the the creation to appear again. And then they come out. They're in a dormant state. Now I asked I asked the question, or not asked, but I I was wondering what happens to those who are performing devotional service. And then the the cycles end and. Do they go back into the Maha, to Maha Vishnu and have to stay there? Because it says that devotional service is not interrupted by anything material. So I was curious what happens to those who are performing devotional service. So it's interesting. There's a special gift <laughs> that those who are performing devotional service and then everything ends, they go back home, back to Godhead, no matter what situation they're in. They immediately get to go back to the spiritual world. That's a special. That's mentioned in the third canto. But for the general souls who are materialists, which are the large majority of the population, they go, they merge into the body of Mahavishnu and stay what is called yoga nidra into a slumber state, inactive state. Mm -hmm. They're in the body of the Lord. They stay there. So actually it's endless opportunity for the souls to, to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Once you, once you begin devotional service, you always have a more, you, you, that continues. It's never interrupted. 
But for the non-devotees, they're moved by the material energy. The devotees are under the care of Krishna through the spiritual energy. It's different. Okay, Hare Krishna. Okay. Um, Maharaj, can you explain um, how time is eternal uh, in the material and spiritual concept? Like when we go to spiritual world, there is no time, and here we have time. So, can you? Well, the material world is eternal, also. In other words, we were just talking about the end of the creation, and then interim period and then the beginning of another creation. So material world will continue to, to be destroyed and recreated, destroyed, recreated, like that. So that goes on eternally. So each of the creations are temporary, but each of the manifestations are, the manifestations keep coming one after another, and so they're eternal. So time accompanies the material energy. So that's also eternal. Because that's how you understand material energy through the time factor. If there was no time, you wouldn't understand anything because everything is understood in time. Mm -hmm. But in the spiritual world, because nothing changes, everything is eternal. Time is the factor that brings things into existence, moves things along, and then ultimately ends something. But there's no beginning and end in the spiritual world, so there's no time there. But there's a kind of spiritual time, which is the yoga maya, that is produced by the spiritual energy in the spiritual world, that gives uh, direction to Krishna's pastimes. So Krishna gets up at a certain time, he performs this activity at a certain time. So it, it's not material time, it's spiritual time. But it, hasn't, it doesn't have any effect of beginning and end. It exists eternally also. Is that clear? No? Well, I can't speak Slovenian, but I'm sorry. Well, you know, Bhagavad Gita speaks about Ishwara, Jiva, Prakriti, Kala, Karma. These are the five topics of the Bhagavad Gita. So it says that Ishwara, Jiva, Prakriti, and Kala are eternal says it in the introduction. But karma is not. So term, karma is the only one that's temporary out of the five subjects in Bhagavad Gita. So time is eternal because the material manifestations are eternal. Mm -hmm. That's that's the simple answer. It's like in a package. Yeah. Like time is part of the material energy. Mm -hmm. You can't separate it. It comes past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Maybe through time I'll understand more. Mm, okay. But don't stay around too long to figure it out. <laughs> go back go back to the spiritual world and, and you'll know you'll have all your questions answered. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> yeah. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, time I am. <laughs> That's me. Mitra Sarva Harasya Aham. I am time I am death and time is a feature that brings about death. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada says when you're born and you live for two days, you're dead for two days. <laughs> you live for twenty years, you're twenty years dead. So you, someone asks you how old you are. So you say, I'm 35. That means you're 35 years dead. 
Yeah. That means 35 of years of your life is gone. 35 is dead. So if you're 50, you're 50 years dead. <laughs> and then soon you'll be dead dead. <laughs> Your body, not you. <laughs> so time is that factor that, that moves things along. Forty more years to go? Dead for forty dead years more to go in possession for me, approximately. So you have you have are you you're gonna live for forty more years? Yeah. Okay. No. No, oh yeah. Well you if you can stick around well, that's pretty good. You can stick around for forty years, but it's not it's not gonna get nicer here, so you might wanna leave sooner. <laughs> Yeah, well, that means you have, you, if you have 40 meters left, that means you have 40 meters l alive. Mm -hmm. And whatever's gone is dead, but whatever's in future is still alive. So when you first start, you got a bigger scale on the live side. And as you get older, the dead scale becomes bigger, right? And when you get to 70, Ooh, you think? I could go any minute. <laughs> there's that there's that statement, three score and ten. You know what three score and ten means? Huh? Three score, S C O R E. Three score and ten. Score means twenty years. Three score is 60, and 10 plus 10 is 70. Three score and 10. So after that, you should be looking, shopping for your place where you're gonna, you know, throw this thing when it gets old. <laughs> Go. Anyway, such a nice class. <laughs> I'm glad all of you are quite old here. There's only a few youngies here, but all of you are mostly old, so. You can really appreciate this class. <laughs> Young people think, oh God, here's one of those Hare Krishna classes again. <laughs> the soul is very old. <laughs> it's been around for eternity. And that's the, that's the good news. You just have to choose where you're going to go when you on your next body, that's all. Where do you want to hang out? You want to come back here? You want to go down to the lower planets? You want to be a little cockroach running around the floor? Where do you want to be when you're in your next life? So you can determine that by how much you engage in loving devotional service. So the more you become Krishna conscious, the more your spiritual body is formulating now. As you're sitting here right now, Whatever devotional service you perform, your spiritual body is actually starting to formulate. And when you reach perfection, your material body is gone, and your spiritual body is there. And you're in your natural position. It's happening right now, so according to how much advancement you make, that's how much your spiritual body has been developed. All souls are eternal. <laughs> so you might say, yeah, the soul is ancient because the soul is never born, never dies. It's part of Krishna, and Krishna is eternal. <laughs> so uh, all souls manifest at the same time? I mean, oh, they all are part of Krishna, and Krishna is eternal. <laughs> yeah. It's not like... It's not like some souls came first and then some other souls came later, no. Souls are all eternal. <laughs> we can't figure out what's eternal because we think in terms of time. It's not possible. How can you think about something that doesn't begin and doesn't end? Because everything in this world begins and ends. 
And therefore, that's our, that's our experience. So when you talk about eternality, it's all, it's, all, you can, all you can think about is you can't really figure it out. <laughs> you can't really figure it out. But if you, you know, if you went to a, a very good, say you went to a Brigger reader, or a Brigger reader is one of the best astrologers. They have these Brigger readers in India, and they can tell you who you were in your past lives, in any one of your past lives. They can read your astrological chart simply, and they can, t and they can also tell you when you're going to die in this life. They, they can tell you your past and your death. They can tell you the, how things will happen in this life and when you will leave the body. That's called Brigo readers. It comes from Brigo Muni, who is one of the demigods coming from Lord Brahma. And these are the best astrologers. <laughs> They're Indra Maharaj went to see one Brigo reader. <laughs> he told him a lot of things about himself. <laughs> So this is higher class than Jyotish? Well, this is the highest Jyotish. <laughs> These Brigger readers are, they know past, present, and future. <laughs> Trikala Gyan. <laughs> that means they can transcend material time. <laughs> so, but you can go back into your past and see who you were in a previous life. Sometimes devotees even know who they were. There's one devotee in London. I know her well, really well. She knows who she was in her past life. She has dreams about it. She was a brahmachari in Scotland who died in a car accident when she was out on San when he was out on Sankirtan. And the same brahmachari came back as an Indian lady now. And it's interesting because they traced the history of that brahmachari and they found out he was one, he was very attached to this one Indian lady, although he was a brahmachari. <laughs> so because he got attached to this lady, when he died, he took a birth as a lady, an Indian lady. And she remembers her past life. She can talk about it. She's written about it, too. It's really clear. I know her really well. Her name is Ratna, Ratna, Ratnavali. Yeah, Ratnavali. She stays in London. And she does Harinam all the time. <laughs> She's finished with the material world. So such a sweet lady too. She's so nice. <laughs> I have the whole story of her life. She wrote it and she published it also. Yeah. So, so you can find out your last life. It's not so hard. To find out your life before that is really hard. Last life is easy to find, who you were in your last life. But it's not really helpful because if you were like the king of Slovenia last life or the president of Slovenia, you might think, hmm, boy, you know, they should, they should call me your honor or Mr. President instead of, you know, Bakta Louis, you know. <laughs> so you might get, you might start identifying with who you were in your last life. <laughs> it's not so good. <laughs> and if you were in a lower situation, you might, you, there was a, there was a, an experiment that was done on British Broadcasting Television, BBT. They did it publicly. They took this lady and they put her under hypnosis. And she went back into her a previous life, right on TV. And uh, she started to, what, to use the word, freak out. <laughs> She started to really get scared. She was screaming. They had to stop the experiment. Because in her last life, she was, in her experience, she was experiencing how she died in a previous life. So when you go into your last life, you may also go into your, 
how you die in that life. So that's a little dangerous. But we had many lives. This is not this. This is just one of the lives that we have. It's the latest one. <laughs> Let's hope we can. Let's close the book now and start a new, chap, a new, a whole new book, and come back to the spiritual world, and then we can finish all these, these bodies that we have to take. Otherwise, if you want to stay here, you can. You can, if you want to stay in this. If you think material life is nice, and you want to be in a good material position. You can perform devotional service and get a good material position in your next life if you don't finish. In fact, you're guaranteed a good material position in your next life if you don't finish. So right now, even if you don't make it to perfection, say you leave your body, you'll get a good, you'll get a good situation in your next life because you're a devotee. And that comes automatically. But that doesn't mean your good position will give you happiness. You may be born in a rich family, or you may be born in a very saintly family. But still, taking birth means difficulty. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.